Well, thanks so much for coming out to hear about the end of the world. Um, and thanks uh, to the town hall for putting on this amazing series. It's so terrific that there's public science education going on like this, uh, especially in a time when funding is being cut to sciences at the national level. So we need to keep pushing for as much science education as possible. Um, so I've just finished writing an uh, optimistic book about the apocalypse. And it didn't start out that way at all. I really did not realize that this book was going to have a happy ending. And it actually started because I've been really fascinated my whole life with stories about destruction, especially massive global destruction and apocalypses and um, you know, everything from kind of the underground cannibal apocalypse to zombie stories and um, Godzilla stories. Uh, Godzilla is kind of one of my spirit animals. And um, I wanted to, a couple of years ago when I was um, thinking about this, I thought, well, how could I write a kind of nonfiction version of a Godzilla movie? And what, what would that look like? You know, we, if we delved into you know, the scientific literature and, and what history has to teach us, you know, what would be the, the equivalent of, of some kind of mass, massive destruction caused by a force that we don't understand? And I came upon the idea of mass extinctions, which are um, indeed the worst kind of disaster that could ever happen to the planet. And the more that I researched them, the more that I read scientific papers and talked to scientists, I realized that actually one of the main characteristics of a mass extinction is that there are always survivors. And that was when I really began to change how I understood what this book was going to be about. So let me start by telling you a little bit about the destruction. Uh, a mass extinction is actually a scientific uh, term of art which refers to any event where more than 75% of all species on the planet die out. And usually these take about, uh, about a million years. And so when you look at them, they're taking place in geological time. They're not a quick thing that, that we can see in a human, uh, a human lifetime. And one of the things that links pretty much all of the mass extinctions, and there have been five of them so far in Earth's history over the past half billion years or so, is that all, most of them are caused by climate change. So usually there's some horrific event uh, that sets off the climate change. Maybe an asteroid hits the planet, uh, which is what happened in the most recent and perhaps most famous mass extinction, which is the one that extinguished the dinosaurs 65 million years ago when an asteroid slammed into the planet. Um, but of course, when that happened, actually, it wasn't like a Michael Bay movie. It wasn't like a big rock hit the planet and there was like fire and like dinosaurs were being like barbecued. And although that sounds really cool, there were no, and there were no lasers or anything like that. Um, what actually happened was, of course, where the asteroid hit, there were horrific fires and, and uh, creatures were killed by the thousands. But over time, the uh, ejecta from the asteroid uh, worked its way into the atmosphere and changed the climate uh, over the long term. And so actually what happened was most dinosaurs died out from the subsequent uh, climate changes. And this is the case with, like I said, nearly all the mass extinctions. So, let me tell you a little bit about my favorite mass extinction to give you an idea of how these work. Um, everyone kind of has a favorite mass extinction. If you talk to geologists about this, they always kind of, they have a, a gallows humor about it because, uh, you know, these are, these are horrific uh, mass slayings um, of creatures. And so my, my personal favorite is the one that comes at the end of the Permian period. And if you look at this uh, chart here of um, geological periods, you can see it kind of down near the bottom. And there's even a little thing that says gigantic extinction uh, right next to the Permian. Uh, so this was about 250 million years ago. And at that time, the planet, uh, due to plate tectonics, the continents were completely different uh, than they are now. They were arranged into one giant supercontinent, Pangaea. So you have to imagine a supercontinent sort of stretching all the way from the North Pole down to the South Pole. And uh, that was um, when, in the North, uh, when, um, 
So basically, in the north, the area that eventually became Siberia began to turn into a supervolcano. And what happens in a supervolcano is not a scientific term, but it basically refers to a massive, massive volcano. And this was a volcano caused by an igneous province, which is just a very large area where, where lava is being released in multiple places. So you have to imagine great big vents opening up in the earth. It's not like a mountain where it's kind of blowing up on the top. It's big vents opening up, kind of like the Iceland uh, volcano that we saw recently. And they just start uh, extruding lava, big waves of lava. So again, not, it's not explosive, it's just lava oozing out of these huge cracks and vents. Um, and there's multiple vents. And so in this northern area of Pangaea, this uh, event went on for about, oh, let's say, a thousand years. So it was a thousand year eruption. And what happened was, over time, the gases and ash that were released from that volcanic eruption were kind of like a super industrial revolution. They were releasing so much carbon into the environment that the climate first started to cool down and then it heated up into a super greenhouse and the oceans became very acidic and creatures died out in incredible numbers. It was the worst mass extinction that the planet has ever seen. And by the end of that million year period, 95% of all species on the planet had died out. Even insects died out, which is very unusual. You don't usually see insect deaths in a mass extinction. But it was sea creatures, land creatures, plants. Everybody was screwed by that volcano. <clears throat> but there was one survivor on land who kind of is the creature that actually turned me around on mass extinction and made me think about them in a new way. And it was a creature who is related to uh, a group of animals that later evolved into mammals. So it was kind of a mammal-like creature. Think of it as kind of the uncle of, of humanity, uh, not, not our direct ancestor. Uh, and its name is Lystrosaurus. And Lystrosaurus had a couple of traits that made it an excellent survivor in this incredibly difficult time in Earth's history. Uh, it was somewhat small. It was about a dog size. It was about three feet long, two to three feet long. Looks like a little bit like a pig and a little bit like a lizard. And they were burrowers. So you have to imagine them eating kind of the way pigs do, like probably eating tubers and roots and they probably burrowed uh, in the evening. So they would dig a burrow. They had very powerful uh, front legs. And so they were digging out um, holes and, and living underground a lot. So for Lystrosaurus, it was kind of awesome when the volcano started going off because the whole world was kind of transformed into Lystrosaurus heaven because they were used to being underground and breathing kind of uh, you know, dirty air anyway. They had a great lung capacity, which means that possibly they were able to uh, get more oxygen from dirty air than um, other creatures uh, that were similar in size. And the other thing about Lystrosaurus was that a lot of its natural predators died during the early Triassic, which was the period that followed the Permian. So it had no predators. It had dirty air. All of its food sources were mostly underground, so if the sunlight is blocked <clears throat> and temperatures are changing, that food source is probably going to be mostly unharmed uh, by that transition. But one of the other things that Lystrosaurus did was it scattered across the southern continent. So remember, this is a huge supercontinent. Lystrosaurus moved from a more northern region all the way down into the south. And this is a, over a period of millions of years and scattered across that continent, speciated, in other words, evolved into many different species, maybe possibly four, possibly more, and adapted to new ecological niches. It did two of the things that I talk about in the title of my book. It scattered and adapted. It fled from the source of danger, which was this super volcano, and learned how to live in new places. And you know, this humble little weird-faced guy um, sort of became my mascot when I was, when I was um, working on this book. Um, I, I guess I traded in Godzilla as my mascot and picked up Lystrosaurus because this creature was, as I said, he was very humble and 
Yet, nevertheless, it managed to make it through the toughest time in Earth's history while all of these other creatures around it were suffering because